He says in verse 31, you shall not worship Yahweh your God, the Lord your God, in that way. For every abomination to the Lord which he hates, they have done to their gods. For they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add or take away from it, period. Verse 32 of Deuteronomy chapter 12. So we're seeing very clearly instructions that we have no biblical right as believers to take anything that was used and constituted and dedicated and de uh, for the worship of other gods and, and literally uh, just uh, Christianize those things and use those things in the worship of our God. We just flat out can't do it. Why? It's very similar to this story. It would be very similar to you husbands out there that you buy your, uh, your wife an anniversary present every single year. Well, let's pretend that your wife's, uh, or birthday present, let's pretend that your wife's birthday is on April 22nd. And April 22nd, every year, uh, you buy her a gift for her birthday, like we should. But let's pretend that you had an old girlfriend, and her birthday was March 22nd. And so you dated this girl for 10 years, and it's just, it, it was much easier for you to remember March 22nd rather than April 22nd. So imagine going to your wife and saying, Honey, I, I tell you what, I, it's so hard for me to remember your birthday every year. Would you mind if we switch your birthday from April 22nd to March 22nd? I don't think she's going to be real thrilled about moving her birthday to the same birthday of her enemy, uh, your former girlfriend. That's just not the way it works. Even in human terms, we're offended at moving something that's precious to us to something that's not precious to us. How much more does our God have difficulty with the fact that we are celebrating His Son's birthday? We've moved it from its proper time in the fall during the Feast of Tabernacles when He was born, the Feast of Sukkot, to the time of the ancient fertility gods, the sun gods of both the East and the West. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2 says, Do not add to what I command you to do, and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. And of course, we read in Deut Deuteronomy 12, 32, so he sees that you do not do all that I command you. Do not add to it or take away from it. Proverbs 30, verse 6 says, Do not add to his words, or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. Remember, he cannot change the truth. His only goal is to keep you from it. And how does he do it? By adding just a little bit of poison. And you don't have to have much poison, ladies and gentlemen, to ruin the entire thing. You might say, well, you know what? Not, not, it, maybe it, it, it does matter what it means to him, and it doesn't really matter to me, but Jim, is it really that bad? I mean, it, it feels so good to celebrate Christmas and Easter and do things uh, the, the way that we've always done them. Folks, we don't live off of the way that we feel. We live off the way that he feels. And the truth is, is how much of this information that I'm presenting has to be true before it poisons everything. If I had a pure glass of water and I just put one little grain of poison in it, would you drink it? Of course not. Even though you couldn't see it, even though it appeared to be pure, even if it tasted pure, you certainly wouldn't take it. In the same way, I don't know about you, but the way that I read my Bible is that he gave us his pure word. And he never intended for us to add anything to it or to take anything away from it. We are to do Bible things in Bible ways because his system always produces fruit of life. It produces the tree of life on the inside of us when we do things his way. When we don't do things his way, when we mix together the truth with a lie, what happens is we grow inside of us the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that never brings life, my friends. It brings bondage and death. I want to share with you some alternatives, uh, biblical alternatives, something that's straight from God Himself, things that He tells us to celebrate, curriculums designed for our children. Look at some of these holidays. First of all, we have uh, what did all of the disciples do in the spring that just so happens to be the time of Easter? Absolutely. It's called Passover. Luke 22, 19 says this, And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do Passover. Obviously, Easter was nowhere in the minds of our Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, or his disciples, or anybody for hundreds of years. 
they celebrated what's in Hebrew called Pesach, Passover, every single year, remembering the death, burial, and resurrection of their Lord through that incredible holiday where they used to sacrifice a Passover lamb for the remembrance of the death of the firstborn and, uh, and the freedom from Egypt. But now today they were remembering the freedom from sin, freedom from Egypt being metaphorical by the death of Jesus himself. So they would never have connected Easter with Passover. It didn't exist. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul even instructs us in verse 8, Therefore, let us keep the festival, talking about Passover, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with the bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. And anyone that has celebrated a Passover or has come to a Passion for Truth Seder has discovered the depth of the burial and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, in the Passover itself. And I personally believe that if we begin to keep the Passover in these feast days uh, for our children or for our families, we will see the power of God come into our lives like it did in the first century because they didn't have Christmas. They didn't have Easter. They celebrated the biblical holidays, the holidays on his calendar, not the holidays on the Roman calendar. Now let's talk about when Jesus or Yeshua was really born. Can we discover exactly when he was born? We absolutely can. We can just follow the Bible as it tells us and gives us hints of when our Savior was actually born. It starts off with John the Baptist. We know that John the Baptist's father's name was Zacharias. Zechariah was, was, was a priest of the line of the Levites. And in the Old Testament, it tells us that he was the eighth course of the, of the Levitical priesthood. What does that mean? That means that he was the eighth person to serve a one-week service at the temple. They had 24 courses of priests that served for one week. And then week two, the second course would serve. Week three, the third course would serve, and so on and so forth, until they went through all 24 courses, and then it would start over again. We know from the Scriptures exactly when the course of Zechariah was. And that's when the angel came to Zechariah and said, you're going to have a baby boy. And go figure, that's when he rushed home, his wife became pregnant, and nine months later puts it right in Passover. So because we know John the Baptist was born at Passover, you just simply take the Gospels, which says that Yeshua was born six months after Passover, and that puts us right in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles, or in Hebrew, it's called Sukkot. And so that's how we know that Jesus was born during the Feast of Tabernacles, which is in the middle of September, October on our calendar, in our, what we call in our season, fall. It even says that the shepherds were still in the field. Well, we know that the shepherds in Israel are always brought in uh, right around or right after the feast, uh, the feast of Sukkot in the fall, because in the wintertime, it would have been too cold to have the cattle out in the field. And it's just another indication, another proof that our Savior would not have, could not have been born at the end of December. Well, I'm going to quickly go through all seven feasts so you can kind of get an idea and a taste for God's calendar and the things that He's called His people to do. First of all, there are seven, one for each day of the week, if you will, one for each millennium. There are seven millenniums. Everything is in sevens, which is why seven is the number of perfection. It starts off in the spring around our March, April, March or April with Passover. Passover is the day that Jesus or Yeshua died on. He became the Passover lamb. He was buried during the seven-day, eight-day festival of the unleavened bread, where they would remove sin or leaven from their house. He rose three days later exactly on the Feast of First Fruits, when the priest would wave the sheaf offering, the first of the of the barley before the Father, the Messiah, was rising from the dead, saying, asking for a great harvest in the fall from His Father, just like the priest was at the exact same time. And then 50 days later is the feast of what we call in Greek, Pentecost. In Hebrew, it's Shavuot. And that's when the Holy Spirit came down. And it is 1,200 years to the day earlier that the, that the, commandments, were, the commandments were given on Mount Sinai on the day of Pentecost. There is so much here, ladies and gentlemen. If you've never studied the feast days, I encourage you to get that series called the prophetic calendar, God's prophetic calendar that we have, 
where we go through and I detail in tremendous detail all of the things that are built into these feast days and the prophecies that are built into these of His first coming and His second coming. Then we move, that's called the spring feast days. Those have been fulfilled and those are all connected to His first coming. He died on Passover, was put in the grave during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, He rose on first fruits, and the Holy Spirit came down on the Feast of Shavuot or Pentecost. The last three feast days are called the fall feast days. Those have not been fulfilled yet. Those are reserved for His second coming. The first one is the most interesting in my opinion. It is called the Feast of Trumpets or Yom Terah, the blowing of the trumpets. And you should make some connections you, if you're a Bible student out there, that the dead in Christ will rise first at what? At the sound of a trumpet. This is what it's talking about. Then we come ten days after the Feast of Yom Terah, the Feast of Trumpets, to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, where the high priest once a year put the blood of the goat on the Ark of the Covenant, satisfying the Torah and making up for all the sins of Israel for the entire year. And the very last feast day, the, very mo the most exciting feast day of all, is the eight-day festival of Sukkot, which is connected to the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. It is the greatest celebration in all of Israel all year long where God's people celebrate and party for eight days straight and it is the recognition that that is when the millennium is going to start. Even in Judaism they'll say that the Messiah is going to come back at the Feast of Trumpets and that celebration will begin where the big wedding feast happens during the Feast of Sukkot. And so you can see the biblical connections through our what we call the New Testament all the way through this prophetic calendar. Can you imagine if we would have understood this calendar from the very beginning and raised our kids in doing Bible things in Bible ways and calling Bible things by Bible names, how different and how much stronger our families would be because we would have something to hold on to that's real. And so I would encourage each and every one of you to look into these things and discover for yourself the truth, the deeper truths that are right here for all of us, the curriculum, if you will, for our families to follow the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob this exact same way that our forefathers did. We've gone through all of the feast days and explained how they're prophetic in nature, from the spring feast days being about the first coming to the fall feast days being about the second coming, and how much curriculum God built into the Word to teach our children and to teach us the deeper things that is inside of him to bring out inside of us today. Well, a lot of people ask me, well, Jim, if, if, I'm, if I come to the place where I'm not comfortable doing Christmas, what can I do to replace it? What about Hanukkah? Well, Hanukkah is not a prescribed holiday of the Bible. It's not a, a commanded feast day. It's what's called a minor feast day. And so I'm going to give you just a little history behind Hanukkah because Hanukkah is one of the most exciting holidays of the year for my personal family. Uh, my children look forward to Hanukkah every single year. And so let me give you a little quick 60-second background of where Hanukkah came from because most of you may not be familiar with this particular holiday because it is a Jewish holiday uh, from our perspective. Well, if you go back in time to about 170 years before Jesus showed up on the scene, about 168 B.C., about a hundred years after Alexander the Great was ruling the then known world, uh, another king came up. And that king, its name was uh, Antiochus Epiphanes IV. And he was a bad king. He was a Greek. And they came into Jerusalem, take, took over Jerusalem, and they set up a statue of Zeus in the temple. And so they would not allow the Jewish people at that time, all the Israelites, to sacrifice to Yahweh. They wouldn't allow them to practice their religion. Uh, they were very harsh on them and hard on them until one day they had had enough and the Jewish people decided to take back the temple of their God into their own custody. And that man that led that charge was the name Judah Maccabee and his followers and his family. Well, they did so and they took back the temple and they held an incredible celebration for eight days after that that began to be known as the Festival of Lights. And they celebrated those eight days, most likely because they did not have a chance to celebrate the eight days of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, while they were in bondage with the Greeks. And so every year after that, all the way up to the time of Jesus himself, Jesus was said in the Gospels to go celebrate the Feast of Dedication. And the Feast of Dedication in Hebrew is Hanukkah. And so we 